Egypt is a place where a lot of people choose to go on vacation. It's about a strange country that was a kind of old wonder. The Egyptian pyramids in Giza are the first thing that comes to mind when you think of this country. Ancient Egyptians had a lot of strange and weird ideas about everything, even sex. Today, we're going to talk about some of the strange sexual practices that people in ancient Egypt had. The Egyptians had stories about how the world was made, just like people from other countries. Egyptians believed in many gods, and the story they told about how the world was made is a little strange. In some ways, the myth is like the Christian story of how the world was made. In the beginning, there was nothing at all in the world. According to Christianity, there is only one God who made the world. However, the Egyptians thought that the world was made by Adam, the only live God who masturbated, creating two gods who are identical. The sexual practices in ancient Egypt were based on this myth. The Egyptians thought that masturbation was the source of all life, so it was used in many practices. The Egyptians were very interested in birth and making things, and many of their myths were about fertility. There were ritual masturbations in the Nile River by the Egyptian pharaohs. This was seen as a sign of life and fertility. They didn't see life's events in a straight line. Instead, they saw things in a circle. People lived in places that were often flooded by the Nile. The Egyptians used the word inundation for both floods and births and seed semen. They saw the same qualities in their own seeds and in the Nile floods, which mostly had to do with birth and making new life. The myth we just talked about led to another story that had a sexual theme. It's about the story of Horus and Seth. I give that story a lot of strange sexual parts. Seth and Horus were two gods who were always at odds with each other. Their daily fight is the best example of how Egyptians lived. When they first got together, they fought over the throne, or who should take over the throne from Osiris, who was Horus's father and brother Seth. Eventually, Horus took over the throne. This made Seth very angry, and he was always at odds with Horus because of it. No one really cared about virginity. The concept of virginity was not particularly valued in Egyptian culture. There was no importance attached to getting married as a virgin. It was common practice to have sexual intercourse prior to marriage, and as long as it was between two single people, there was no social stigma associated with this behavior. Virginity did not have the same theological meaning as it had for the Romans, who equated female virginity with godliness and considered sexual restraint a virtue. In addition, the Romans did not view sexual restraint as a virtue. While having sexual encounters before being married was perfectly acceptable, once you got married, you were more or less committed to that relationship, especially if you were a woman. The ancient Egyptians placed a very high level of reverence on married women, and as a result, having sexual contact with other people outside of one's marriage was regarded highly immoral. It should therefore come as no surprise that individuals found guilty of infidelity were subjected to extraordinarily severe punishments. Both people involved in an affair with a married woman could face severe punishments, including flogging, mutilation, or even death, if the affair is discovered to be consenting. Obviously, the only consequence a married guy faced from society for having sexual relations with a single woman was to feel some embarrassment. In ancient Egypt, a divorce could only be granted under one of two circumstances. Either the couple had no children or the wife had been unfaithful. Divine Myths Surrounded Masturbation when the ancient Egyptians made up their gods and goddesses, they didn't think about how humans are born. Cosmic mythology says that the first god Adam came from nothing, making himself from a pool of primordial goo. After that, he built the world. But first he sexed himself. Right away after that, he spit out the god Shu and the goddess Tefnut. They made more gods and goddesses and more parts of society. The Egyptians thought the masturbation part of the story was very important, so male joy took on a divine quality. Some stories say that pharaohs masturbated into the Nile as a ritual. What the ancient Egyptians did about dirty pictures wasn't very advanced compared to the Romans. There were some sexy images, though. The Turin erotic papyrus, which had a bunch of sexual scenes, is the most well-known example. The papyrus is 8.5 feet long and 10 inches high, and two-thirds of it shows a messy man having sex with a young woman. It shows different situations, each one braver and more creative than the last. For example, one shows the couple fighting in a way that doesn't make sense on a chariot. 
Many experts believe that the ancient Egyptians made the Turin erotic papyrus as a joke, and not because they thought it was sexual or meant to make people feel aroused. Homosexuality and Incest Like the ancient Greeks and Romans, the Egyptians were okay with gay people living together. An individual who would be in charge of a gay relationship would be more respected in public. Someone who was lower on the hierarchy, on the other hand, was seen as submissive in that relationship. In the myth about Seth and Horus, there was a connection between forces just like this one. Not only did Seth and Horus fight for the throne, but they also had sexual relations in which one god was in charge and the other was subservient. Seth was in charge, so he made Horus be the woman in the relationship and accept the part of subordinate. The other god supported Seth in this. The plan that Seth had was foiled by Isis, who kept Seth's children from meeting Horus. She lied to Seth to get him to eat Horus's sperm, which gave Horus the end victory. In ancient Egypt, incest was ubiquitous. A lot of evidence suggests that parents and children often got married and had sexual relations. This was common in royal and priestly homes. They were allowed to do things that regular people were not allowed to do. In many ways, the Egyptian king Ptolemy II agreed with this practice. He saw this kind of submission as totally normal. They were brother and sister, and King Tut married his half-sister. This meant that he was born through incest. Tutankhamun, one of the most famous pharaohs, was also born from a connection between a brother and a sister. This was proven by DNA tests on 11 mummies that were connected to the pharaoh in a close way. Like now, this kind of relationship led to major health problems. Then, this behavior helped the royal family gain more power, even though it was against Egyptian law. It slowly spread to less respectable families and regular people over time. Necrophilia Because the Egyptians were so interested in life, they paid a lot of attention to the future, or life after death. There are also some strange things about death. Among the ancient Egyptians, necrophilia was an important part of their society. Herodotus, a famous Greek scholar, wrote a lot of stories about this tradition that we can learn from. He said that some people didn't let the dead go for a few days because the people who were preserving them liked having sexual relations with the dead. People who worked as embalmers didn't want to have sex with dead bodies because they would start to break down after a few days. Herodotus wrote a lot about this practice, so it was definitely common in ancient Egypt. A lot of stories had something to do with necromancy. We talked about the story of Seth and Horus. Osiris was Seth's brother. When Osiris died, Seth and Horus fought over the throne. Osiris's dead body was slept with by another god named Anubis. Another name for the god Adam is Ra. Adam made the world by masturbating. Horus was born from the connection between Osiris and Isis, who were both dead. This means that Horus was born through necrophilia. Horus later had sexual contact with Seth all the time. If necrophilia was common among the gods, then it was almost certain that it was also common among people on earth. Circumcision and prostitution. People from other cultures thought that the practice of circumcision was very strange because they had never seen anything like it in their own cultures. Over time, this custom spread to many other cultures. For example, when Herodotus wrote, this custom was still common among the Jews, even though their culture wasn't as developed as it is now. Men who were born in Egypt were cut, but tourists who went there did not follow the tradition. At these events, a lot of guys were circumcised at once. Herodotus wrote that more than 120 men could get together at that time, and it might have been fun for them. In ancient Egypt, people thought that prostitution was a good thing. People thought that prostitution was a good thing to do for the gods. In ancient Egypt, prostitutes were seen as pretty important, which is different from how they are seen today in many countries. At this point, prostitution is not legal, and girls who do it often do it behind closed doors and get in trouble with the state. It was very common for prostitutes to work in ancient Egypt. So that they would stand out from other women who weren't prostitutes, they wore bright red lipstick and other makeup. They had a lot of tattoos on their bodies. It wasn't legal for prostitutes to work everywhere. They could only do it in places where their customers would be happy. In Egypt, prostitution was popular and was seen as just another type of trade. In this case, the trade was in people, specifically women who were sexually exploited by powerful royals. Gender transformation 
Because the Egyptians had a psychic sense of time, they also had a sense of gender flexibility. The gods were reborn many times, and their processes of life and death were the same as ours. People used to think that gender changes happened after the fact, but they happened during that time. In order to have a good afterlife, women had to change into guys. In Egypt's past, women did most of the things that men did. Goddesses, on the other hand, had traits of the other sex, so they often had beards in art. Egypt had a need for different kinds of birth control, just like we do now. Egypt had a very open attitude toward sex, so people there loved sexual pleasure. It was thought that condoms made from sheep's guts would keep people from getting pregnant, but they also helped spread STDs. A method of birth control was based on acacia gum. In the past, women would push animal dung, like that of alligators, into their vaginas to stop sperm from getting in. At that time, the Egyptians really cared about birth control and were quite ahead of other countries in this area. To avoid having babies, they used crocodile dung and acacia gum. The ancient Egyptians, like people today, wanted to have some say over how many children they had. Because of this, they came up with ways to stop having babies. According to information found on ancient papyrus, one method they used was to close the mouth of the womb during intercourse with gum made from acacia tree sap. The fact that acacia gum includes lactic acid, which is known to kill sperm, at least some evidence that this method works. They used a different way where they put honey and sodium bicarbonate together and put it on the inside of the vagina. A kind of diaphragm made of crocodile dung, dates, acacia, and honey was another choice. Cleopatra reportedly made a vibrator out of bees. The idea that Cleopatra was sexually hungry comes from myths and Shakespeare. When the Romans came, Cleopatra had a son with Julius Caesar that she wasn't married to. As time went on, she started dating Mark Anthony, which ended up killing her. But it is said that Cleopatra found other things to do when her bedrooms were empty. Some say she put angry bees inside either a hollowed-out gourd or an empty papyrus box and then used the homemade device as a vibrator. Just to be clear, the vibrator story has always been just a myth that can't be proven. The bees inside the device, on the other hand, are thought to have made it tremble and move, which would have been perfect for Cleopatra's purposes. Bestiality plays a unique role in art. Hieroglyphics from Egypt, which date back to 3000 BCE, show people sleeping with animals. People believe that Egyptian gods and goddesses could change into animals, so the idea of humans and animals having sex was linked to the gods. Also, the ancient Egyptians thought it was less offensive to see physical acts between people and animals than between humans. So some say that what looks like bestiality written in hieroglyphs is actually a secret way of showing how people interact with each other. Even though most Egyptians didn't do it, Egyptian royalty and mythological gods often married and had children with their brothers. Several brother-sister pairs from Egyptian legend can be found, such as Seth and Nephthys, Osiris and Isis, and Shu and Tefnut. And because royalty loves to be like the gods, Egypt's siblings who were in charge often married each other. All of that marriage between different groups of people made the family lines weak and full of genetic problems. Some experts think that King Tut had a disease that weakens bones over time, a cleft mouth, and a curved spine, among other health problems. The first known record of oral appears in Egyptian myth. In old Egyptian mythology, the story of how Osiris came back to life is a classic. Also, it's the first time fellatio has been recorded in history. The god Seth kills and cuts up his brother Osiris, but Isis, who is their sister, puts the pieces back together to try to bring Osiris back to life. One thing is wrong, though. His penis is gone. So Isis makes Osiris a new penis out of clay and blows into it. This brings him back from the dead. The ancient Egyptians often wore amulets that looked like male and female parts as signs of wealth and fertility. One example is the cowrie shell, which looks like a woman's genitalia. Some of the reliefs on tombs date back to almost 2500 BCE and show another early Egyptian interest in genitalia, the practice of circumcision. Paula Vega, a researcher from the University of Lisbon, says that circumcision may have been the first surgery ever done in Egypt. Herodotus also said that priests had to shave and be circumcised on a daily basis. The reliefs, on the other hand, show boys close to puberty being cut, not babies. Vega says this is because the Egyptians thought of circumcision as a big event in a person's life. 
We hope you liked this video. Subscribe to the channel if you're a history addict, and please let us know about civilization or time period we should talk about. Also watch another video here.